It's a while since I've uh, taken apart one of my own designs and reverse engineered it. And this uh, dates back to 1999. It's back when I was still going to nightclubs, clubs of ill repute in Glasgow. And as one does in clubs of ill repute, I used to take my own little lighting modules and test them, particularly the audio active ones. And this one was uh, an other one ever actually wore it. This one was designed to wear on a belt, like a, a buckle. And it uh, takes a couple of standard alkaline cells in these improvised holders. Actually, you know what? That is feels quite loose. I'm going to have to bend the battery holder down. Suddenly it's all coming back now that I, I remember bending those battery holders down. And I don't know if you're going to see this, but uh, some of the LEDs are glowing very dimly. They're glowing very dimly. Because it's a, a 4017, until it uh, resets completely in one cycle, it won't... Uh, the a random number of LEDs will light, but the idea is that on the beat of the music, uh, an LED would step about randomly on it. And it's not very bright. At the time, blue LEDs were not available yet. It was 1999, and I wanted to run it off a couple of the button cells. Lithium cells are a bit hard to get hold of as well at that time. Uh, otherwise, these days, it might be a stack of two lithium cells. But I... Hold on, I can actually, uh, I printed this out, I'm just, uh, I should just cut straight to the chase here. Let's take a close look at the circuit, so let's focus down onto this. And maybe zoom in a little bit. So the circuitry consisted of a 4017, which is the Johnson counter, which uh, is a sort of decade counter. It's got 10 outputs, and it's got a clock input, and you can program it by just basically putting a link. If you only want to count to a count of five, you can put a link from the 6 input to the reset and it will automatically, as soon as it's counted beyond 5, it will reset to the first one again. The microphone, which is a slightly fluffy looking top here, uh, picks up the audio. It, it drives this transistor, which uh, is set up as a high gain amplifier, which then toggled the clock input to this. It's not an ideal, it's not a normal arrangement, but uh, it worked. So let's uh, zoom out here because if we take a look at the back of the circuit board, which I've flipped... I use that uh, because I'm going to be reverse engineering this. We can see that it looks a bit scruffy in the back, I have to say. There's lots of flux residue on the back of this circuit board. But having said that, keep in mind this dates back uh, 1999. It's 2019 as of the point of making this video. That is some considerable. That's 20 years ago. And there's no sign of corrosion, actually, where that flux has been sitting, which is quite impressive. It was also coated, I'm pretty sure with a flux spray, or was that normal lacquer? There was a, for a while I used a flux lacquer that you sprayed the whole circuit board with it and then just soldered through it. It was actually quite good. Um, I don't know if that's what this is. It feels a bit too, it doesn't feel as sticky as the other one did. So I'm guessing this is just lacquer to protect it. Likewise, I have sprayed the front of the circuit board black because the material I used was a prototyping material, which is a hybrid between fiberglass and resin bonded paper. And it, you, the cheap SRBP silicon resin bonded paper, uh, it, uh, is, it has weaknesses. It's very easy to drill. It's cheap because it's just cheap and easy to make. But it has a weakness that the pads don't tend to adhere to it properly. So this prototype material, which I don't think is made anymore, that used to be made by Mega Electronics, or it used to be supplied by Mega Electronics, uh, it's a layer of fiberglass on the outside with the paper on the inside, and it results in a very white material. Some people have asked about my circuit boards in the past regarding this, but um, unfortunately it doesn't appear to be as easily available. You end up with that sort of dull, greeny, greyish look instead. Other things worthy of mention, if it looks as though I've cropped down these pads a lot, it's simply because I've filed the bottom of the circuit board once it was all soldered, just to flatten everything down to avoid the sharp points because it was designed as a sort of wearable thing, which I, I didn't wear. I didn't have the courage to wear this in a nightclub. Uh, I had it in the pocket and then as the volume increased overnight, I'd sneak into a corner and pull it out of the pocket and see how it would respond to the beat and then just pop it back in the pocket and then go and continue drinking cider, as one does. So let's reverse engineer this. I'm kind of intrigued as to how I designed this because it's so long since I actually did it. So... Let's start. It operates at 3 volts. It would have been nicer to operate at higher voltage. 
Uh, so let's start with the three volt rail. Three volts, let's draw it sinusoidally just to start off. That's a good start. And zero volts. And they're connected to two alkaline cells for the three volts. I'm going to have to bring this in here and uh, follow this through. I think I can more or less, uh, I know roughly what's happening here. So let's uh, rule out the 4017 for a start. That's the chip, which I'll just draw over here. 4017. It's a CMOS chip, very standard. It's great. You, it's the one that's commonly used in sort of the chasing LED projects you can buy from China. And the output of it, I'm not going to draw them all, but it could drive up to 10 LEDs. And that's exactly what I drove here. It's notable that I didn't, because the outputs aren't a nice pattern, it doesn't go like uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 round it. They tend to jump about a bit. The LEDs, just because it was a single-sided board and it, it didn't really matter, I just took the pins to the nearest LED. Uh, so it's not in the correct sequence. It doesn't really matter. It still has an interesting effect. It means the LED jumps about with the sort of bass beat. So that's the LEDs. I'll draw half of them. And a wee sort of beam of light coming out there. The other thing that I noticed here, I've got two other inputs that are bridged together to the negative rail. So there's also the negative rail up there. Um, those will be the reset input and clock inhibit. I'm trying to remember off memory what they would be. But reset is pulled high. It's normally connected to one of the outputs to actually reset the chip. So if you're not going to use the reset, you just pull it low. Otherwise, if you left it floating, because CMOS is ultra sensitive, it could pick up stray signals that could cause false resetting. Clock inhibit is just used, you take it high, it stops the uh, unit chasing even if it's getting a clock. So we've also got the clock coming in, not sure what's controlling the clock yet. And draw more beams of light up there just for completeness. We have the supply coming in here. First thing I'm spotting here is a capacitor across this, a simple decoupling capacitor across the supply. I notice that, I, as I often do, I've used three identical capacitors, which are 100 nanofarad decoupling capacitors. It's just because I used tons of them in my other circuitry. 104, 100 nano, that's uh, 100,000 picofarad, which is uh, 100 nanofarad. So I've got that decoupling capacitor. Then let's see the other modules. Let's draw. There's the. Where's the signal? There's the clock input. He said drawing a black line where it really shouldn't be black. Black. So that's it. Let's go. Let's draw the transistor. The transistor has the emitter connected to the negative rail. So here's the transistor. And it's a BC547, BC547, just a generic transistor. That's my stock go-to transistor. So where's the collector is connected to the positive rail by a 10K resistor. Okay, so as the transistor turns on, this floating this is the collector's going to float. So let's say uh, collector, emitter, base. The collector's going to float at three volts, but when this turns on, it's going to pull down lower. So that's 10k. And I also see a 560k. Oh, it's going to the base. Okay, that is a common amplifier arrangement. As used in microtransmitters, so that's 560k. It provides a slight feedback. It biases the transistor on, but as the transistor pulls down to the negative rail, it kind of, it has a sort of, it controls it, it sort of biases it off again via that resistor, so it, it provides some sort of element of feedback and makes it just more sensitive, but also amplifies the signal. It, it doesn't sort of compromise it in any way. That's, that's not a very good description. Experts in audio circuits will know exactly what I've drawn, but it is basically a very simple amplifier configuration. So from there, what do I have going from the collector to the clock? I have a 33k resistor, but there's more. Oh, that's a, I've got a 33k resistor. Why? Why specifically 33k? 
because there's a capacitor going to the zero volt rail. That's why it's a very simple filter, probably to filter out high frequencies. So it only responded to bass. And again, this capacitor is the same as the others. It's a 100 nano. Normally on my designs, I just write D next capacitor for decoupling because it's just a common value used for that. Okay, now let's look at the audio circuitry. So I've accounted for that component, that component, that component, that component. I've got a 10k resistor and a capacitor to account for. The 10k resistor is connected to the positive rail. 10k. And goes... That's the wrong 10k resistor. The 10k is going to the microphone, which is then connected to the negative rail. So, microphone and it's the base. It's connected to the base via capacitor from there. So, we have a capacitor from here going to the base of the transistor. That's more or less it. Okay, so let's uh, zoom down in this and describe exactly what's going on here. So there's the battery, there's a the capacitor that's just provided for decoupling just noise suppression across it. Not really needed, but I did. The microphone, the little electric microphones, this little round thing here, act to all intents and purpose like audio resistors in a way. It's not as simple as that. They've got a little capacitor inside and the capacitor is a diaphragm on top. It's metalized film and as you speak and the sound waves go in or as the thumping bass goes in, it makes that film undulate up and down. It changes the capacitance and that results in a, a signal that is amplified inside that to a FET transistor, field effect transistor, which is super sensitive. And what that does is it means that the amount of current this will pass varies. So effectively, it looks like a resistor that varies up and down with the deflection of that uh, diaphragm. So the, what we get here, because we've got a resistor there and this varying resistor here, you get the voltage here wavers up and down. And that is being coupled through this capacitor. The capacitor only allows undulating signals through it. It won't allow DC to pass directly through it. It only couples that AC the base is being biased just barely on by this sort of very simple amplifier arrangement. And that means that as the small signal comes in, this amplifies it up and you get a much wider swing. And it will still be in relationship to the audio signal that was going in, but it will just be increased. It will be a much larger signal. <clears throat> the feedback resistor sets that. The lower it is... The more, actually, in this case, the lower that value would be, the more it would want to turn that uh, transistor on to an, an intermediate stage, but it would be less sensitive as an amplifier. Uh, the higher value it is, the more sensitive it is an am amplifier, if I recall correctly. So now we've got a much greater signal. So we've got the small signal coming in here, which gets coupled in here and gets boosted up to a much bigger signal. And that then is going through to the clock. Now, the clock would normally require a square wave, but it doesn't really matter. It's what it's getting here is a, a very choppy, unpredictable audio wave. But that is being filtered initially so that because the capacitor is effectively sort of absorbing the current, it's, it's taking on a charge and releasing that charge or that AC signal. It has to be of a very low frequency before and a certain volume before it can actually create much of an effect on this. So this will basically damp it down. Uh, I'm trying to think, what's the best way to describe this? It's almost like a damper is the best way to describe it. It's almost like something that absorbs uh, the sort of high frequency noise, but actually lets the low frequency noise through to the clock. And the clock then steps through the outputs in sequence. Now, what I found happened in the nightclub was that as the initially it's not very sensitive it's not picking my voice up at all if i was to blow in this hold on a second i'll try and blow in it 
you can see that it causes the LEDs to deflect around. What actually happens is that as the thumping bass occurred, initially it would start picking up and it would start stepping around one LED at a time. But by the time the night had gone on and lots of cider had been drunk and the volume had been raised significantly, what actually happened was with the thumping bass, uh, it would actually spin randomly around. It would pause. Every time the bass, every gap between the bass, it would stop in a random LED, but in the other ones, it would be circulating randomly around with the actual the sine wave from the bass waveform. So it worked quite well. It's actually a really simple circuit. It's very, very simple. The, it would so much benefit from brighter LEDs. The 4017 is designed to operate from a voltage range of about 3 volts up to a maximum of about 18 volts. That's one of the nice things about the CMOS chips. They had a really huge voltage range. And that means that it would happily operate at the higher voltage, but then you'd have to adjust the component values to match. And I wonder how I tested this. I have a feeling that it's one of many prototypes that I made. Uh, some of them were not even, they didn't have the chasing LED effect. It was just LEDs that lit. And interestingly, I can remember taking the train in to the Glasgow city centre to go to the clubs. And as uh, wind buffeted or there was ambient noise in the train, it picked up the pressure changes. Uh, if someone in the tenement slammed a door or closed the door, it created enough uh, pressure modulation that it would basically cause that LED to sort of increment round just, just one step. And if it was super windy and it was really buffeting the building, you'd also get that slight pressure modulation would also cause it to do a single step round as well. It's quite neat. Oh, quiescent current. I've just tested it. Quiescent current, it's not very bright. Is It really isn't very bright at all. Is like sub one milliamp. You could leave the batteries in this just all the time and it, it didn't really matter. It lasted for ages in those batteries. This is where the higher voltage would be helpful for driving the LEDs and also the extra capacity of something like a something like a nice fat lithium cell or two would actually allow you to operate it much brighter. Rechargeable would be even better. Ooh, there's an idea. A lithium cell, rechargeable lithium cell uh, would work or a little USB uh, adapter so that you could actually run it at 5 volts but then it gets kind of big. But... Um, it was novel. It was one of many items I made round about that time that I took in and just played about with. And I was at the time I was monitoring. I was trying to work out the circuitry for deriving the ultimate base detection for disco lights. And it's a complex subject. It's a very complex subject. You can't just filter out the base and then look for peaks because as soon as voices come in, it skews that because the voices are sort of broadband noise. And uh, the bass, the best you could do is actually count the bass and time it when you had it, or treble, because sometimes the treble is more pronounced than the bass, it's quite complex, you, you need to actually apply a bit of processing power to get a decisive beat out of music. You get the disco lights that do it already, but they tend to use peak detection, amplitude detection, and uh, they sometimes the simplest ones use an op amp, where they've got the, uh, the audio signal, the amplified audio signal is fed to an op amp, and it's on one input to the op amp, it can, has a capacitor and it just basically increases the volume threshold and it hovers up and down at the, the ambient sound level. And then the peaks that are unfiltered will then just clip that and it will create that decisive beat. But this, this was just super simple. This was designed for fun more than anything else and it, it did the job, as did the cider and the loud music and, and the pakora on the way home afterwards. So that was a, one of my own designs just revisited. It's quite interesting. Maybe I should rebuild that and uh, and make some more. But uh, having said that, I don't go to many clubs these days. Such is life. Yeah, I'm more likely to go and listen to my music on YouTube. But there we go. It was quite neat. It was quite fun at the time. It certainly gave me a lot of pleasure building it.